welcome to episode 23 of the Just Run podcast with me, Rhys Morgan. And me, Nathan Marshall. So we're both super excited for this week's guest, and I'll be announcing him shortly. But first, just uh, want to have a quick rundown of mine and Nathan's week, chat about what's going on in their lives, and obviously with the uh, very quick approach of Wales Coastal Path for my co-host here and friend. So um, really curious, mate. I mean, you literally, is it next week? You can be running this? I leave Friday, so when this episode goes out, I will be travelling to Chester. Ooh, and for anybody who, for whatever reason, doesn't know about this yet, um, needs to tell the world exactly what you're doing and what crazy challenge and the charities you're doing it for, mate. All right, so I am running the whole Welsh Coastal Path, 880 miles, with, um, with 60,000 foot of climbing in between. Um, I'll be running for Big Moose and Cerebral Palsy Wales. And I start this Saturday, Saturday the 20th of July, which Oof. I'm working it now, to be honest. Because you know in a taper week, you always, uh, like everything fucking hurts, doesn't it, in a taper week? Yeah. Uh, everything's fucking hurting. I'm thinking, oh, oh, I wish that little niggle would go away. Yeah. God, oh, my knees, oh, my feet. Yeah, well, I mean, just, just a lot of doubt now. I just want to get day one out of the way because day one's going to suck. Now. The time is now. This is it, mate. All, forget all that, mate. Like I said, come that date when you put those trainers on, you jump out that Hummer van, your Hummer van's Hummer van, and you crack on. You'll, you'll just be, you'll be buzzing, mate. You're waiting for views you're going to see, and oh, you're going to have the best time, mate. You really are going to have the best time. And just enjoy the process. Don't worry about the. I know you've, you, and this is easy, easy for me to say because I'm not doing it. But the first day, I know you're worried about and stuff. We've talked about that, but don't worry about that day. The second day, just get ahead in the game and just enjoy it and enjoy the process as well. Because forget about the the FKT at the end. Hopefully, that will come. That's just, I think it's just a fact that you're doing something that there's only a very small amount of people on this planet who have ever done from start to finish, and then. Um, it's going to be the best adventure. Doing it, you know, a lot of it with your son as well. So, mate, I'm truly, yeah, it, truly glad. It's something that I've always like thought. Oh, that looks fucking incredible. Ever since I've seen um, Reese Jenkins's uh, lighthouse when he did the um, FKT about I think about four or five years ago now, um, which actually got me into trail running and ultra marathon running. Um, and the thing that I've got a chance to replicate that, hopefully. Um, it's, it's it's just nuts. Crazy. I would never have thought this was going to happen in five five years ago, as I was just exactly. doing my five ten k's. Crazy. Yeah. Thing is, mate. The problem is with this is a lot of people like I want to do it, and I reckon I'll have a go one day, beating your record, hopefully. Um, yeah. But uh, it's a uh, a lot of people want to do these things. Like you said, they they become want to do's. They become bucket lists, and unfortunately, a lot of them never actually end up getting done because they, oh, I don't this eight hundred and eighty, or and they get all this doubt and negativity come into their head. To do what you do, mate, just fucking book the time off work, start training, and just do it. Just plan and do it because if you don't do it, if for whatever reason something happens and you have to pull out halfway through or whatever, it doesn't matter. Go back and do it again. It's just this, you know, it's the fact that you've got the opportunity to do it. All of us have the opportunity to do these things. Every single one of us. It just depends how much you want it, really. Um, and yeah, yeah the I'm important excited. thing for me was to um, get it out there and start manifesting it. So, like yeah. last year when I finished this, why we were and I looked at my current mileage for the year after that, that week in Pembroke, and I seen that that mileage for my year actually matched the exact coastal path mileage. So I just thought, oh, you know, that's a fucking sign. So I thought, right, I'm going to fucking do this. So I just put it out there. So I thought, yeah. right, I've got to fucking do it now. And I just started putting things in place to, to like get me closer to the start and stuff. And I think yeah. that's really important it's just to get shit done. It's just manifest and just work to, towards it in little steps. Yeah. Anyone can do it. You just yeah. got the belief to. Absolutely. Do hard things. Um like when you want to do something hard, like running the world's coastal path or doing your first half marathon, 5k, 10k, whatever, ultra, uh, that you know it's going to suck and it's going to be hard. Part of the doing the hard things bit is just booking it. 
just getting your debit card out and paying for it, or if you're doing it solo off your own back, just stop making excuses and sit down with a laptop or a bit of paper and plan it. And then you'll find, like you probably have, the more you start, like getting your head into it at first is difficult, but then the, the, the minute you start making notes and working out your route and what you're going to be doing and what, what you're going to be seeing and the mileage, it starts getting exciting. It does. It starts like you get that like adrenaline pumping already and that's it. You're already, you got your foot in that door. Uh, and whether you choose to do it then um, or something happens, like I said, it, it, that is the difficult part. It's just getting it, it's just doing it. So, I, like, I always come back to this podcast, mate, with you. I, I always said, I, I spoke about with a few friends of mine in the past about doing a podcast. She never did it. And then in January, you were like, got an idea, let's do a podcast together. Boom, manifested it within like a couple of days. You'd set the Spotify, you'd set up the page, you did it. So, like, yeah, done. We, we put it out there, and here we are, 23 episodes deep with some amazing guests and some incredible lined up as well. So, so they just, it's a life lesson, isn't it? Whatever you want to do, just take that first yeah. step. I, I think I'm going to do something now, which, again, is I think is manifesting. Um, as you know, we've been in contact from the Bristol Running Show this week um, about doing a podcast at the Bristol Running Show, which we're trying to plan and sort out now and sort like how we're going to do it. But what's come from that is there is no Cardiff Running Show. So... I think the Bristol Running Show want our help to create a Cardiff Running Show. Oh, man, that would be huge. That would be huge because, I mean, just look at the running clubs and the community in Cardiff alone. You know, like it's huge, huge. That would be amazing. So there we are, then we'll put that out there. Yeah, so I'm looking at the venue to be Sophia Gardens. So the cost of the actual hire of Sophia Gardens will be covered by just ticket sales, hopefully, um, yeah. and all vendors completely free just to build mm-hmm. this massive event as a first-timer. Cool. So, yeah, I started cool. to think of beyond the Welsh Coastal Path now and, like, what are we going to fucking do in the future? Yeah, let's get that 880 done first, mate. We'll put a pin yeah. in that and we'll come back. Because I don't want you running through this and, and not enjoying it or your mind's elsewhere. Halfway through, like, day 10 or wherever, and you're like, but it's the fire gardens. No, so you can get your head in the game. <laughs> you're like well, me. You know you're what like it's me, like mate. when you're on a long run, though? You, you, you'll be running and I'll be solving so like all these problems, like how can we do it and stuff. And I'll be sending you a voice notes. Reese, i got an idea. Reese, yeah. I've figured it out. Okay, I'm up for it. That's true, yeah. actually. When you're in a bit of a pain cave and you're like, right, okay, let's get my head somewhere else. What, what can I think of? Just don't go somewhere else so far that you take the wrong route or end up getting lost. <laughs> yeah. But um, looking at the Welsh Coastal Path, that can anyone be ready to run 880 miles? Can they nope. honestly say that they've done the training to run 880 miles? Can they honestly nope. say they're going to be strong enough to do it? No. Nobody it's, it's the unknown, isn't it? And it's how you exactly. manage yourself to the day. So uh, I'm going into it. So like, yeah, let's just get through every day as easy as possible. I mean, it's exciting. It's the unknown. That is what makes it exciting. You know what you're going to do, but you have no idea how your body is going to react physically and mentally. Yes, you know it's going to hurt. But this is something, like I said, only of few rare people actually get to do so this is the unknown this is the exciting thing and that's what i kept saying about the opponent it was it's nowhere near 880 but it's still 100 and i was excited because i didn't know how my body was going to react i didn't know how my my head was going to go or not and if my body was going to withstand it but my head was going to go and i was going to end up pulling out all the other way around and these are the things that you just have to consider and it almost comes subconsciously but and, and I think the key is to not overthink it going into it and just embrace it. Yeah. So um, if if anyone actually fancy doing something like that, I think they should get in contact with us because we could help them plan it and get it done for them. Yeah, because we know people now, you know, like Alan, you know, the running book and stuff, we've got contacts now that are very kindly are willing to help people do this and achieve it. So, yeah, that's definitely something worth putting out there. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and can I say as well, good luck to Steve. Uh, from PFM Coaching, 
who who's going to who's going to do the FKT supported, but he hasn't got a crew, so he's actually going to be doing it self supported, wow. which is just insane. Yeah, good luck, man. That's ridiculous, but absolutely insane, that is. Good luck to you, man. Good luck yeah, to anyone that's... that's self supported his put. So he's okay. he's faced a logical uh, logistic like nightmare. Of, like, where is he going to charge everything? So he's got yeah. to take that into consideration where I haven't got that because I've got the van every night to sort of like charge everything. So yeah, yeah, that must be a right fucking headache for him. But wow. Wow. That must be amazing. Wow. That's insane. That's insane. Crazy. Yeah. Um, man, I've got to talk about my week as well because it was a bit of an exciting week, like unusual week for me as well. So this week. Oh, I, had, yes. uh, I forgot about that. Yeah. I had um, Rod, uh, good friends, Rod and Matt, who run First Light Coffee Shop in Tom Greenlight, my favourite coffee shop, with Rav, I will say as well, a big part of it. Um, yeah, they reached out to me because um, I was presented with a cool opportunity. Um, so a really awesome, inspiring lady and world record holder, multiple world record holder by the name of Kate Strong. Uh, very appropriate surname, by the way. <laughs> Um, she had the launch of her book called uh, Climate Cycle, um, and she asked to do it at first first light. So I was given the opportunity last minute to interview her. Uh, they did have someone lined up for whatever happened. I might be being sloppy seconds, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but I got in there and, um, yeah, there was about probably 10, 15 people in the crowd. And I sat at the, the back of the shop and interviewed her and they had lovely food and just a really nice environment. Like, it her journey, we'll, we'll put links in this to check her out because she is such an inspiring lady. Like we discussed her incredible achievements, her personal journey, how she got here, what she's got planned next. Um, it was all filmed and captured by Matt, who runs or one of the co-founders of, of First Light. And um, looking forward to seeing some video footage and some photos coming from that. Um, but yeah, it was just really cool. Like I've never done that before. Like we've never done a podcast in person either. And sat at the front. She did, you know, I had questions that she presented me with. But the conversation was really nice. It just flowed naturally. I was able to take things from what she was saying. So was the crowd. There was a lot of interaction. Um, it was really cool. Really, really cool. And she's got, um, I mean, this lady has cycled three and a half thousand miles around Britain on a bamboo bike, you know, um, raising awareness for sustainability, climate change, visiting charities, schools. It's, she's done so many amazing things. Um, and she's got another world record she's trying to achieve starting next March called Taff Tidy, which we'll put a link on. And it's about the you know getting as many people as possible to help try and clean out you know Taff Tidy and stuff uh, the River Taff. So yeah, we'll put a link out. But it was just really it was just awesome. Like I was nervous as hell, but I had a couple of beers and um, yeah, it was just great. I got to say thank you to those guys for giving me the opportunity because I think. Going forward, they they thought that I killed it, which is great. Um, and have asked me if there's any other book launches coming up in the future. We can do that. So, um, and obviously, we are going to do a podcast at some point yeah. in the future as well. Okay, so now I'm super excited uh, for this week's guest, all the way from Bagara. Hope I pronounced that correct. From Queensland, Australia, Matt Grills. Um, Matt is a husband, father, an incredible plant-based ultra runner owner of two specialty coffee shops, avid collector of tattoos, and, um, yeah, lover of music. And I've spoken to Matt a lot over the coming past months. And uh, finally, we've been able to link up and get this sorted. And so I'm genuinely psyched to have a, a chat with him, uh, as is Nathan. So, yeah, without further ado, Matt, welcome to the Just Run podcast, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, good morning, good evening. I don't know what time it is, but it's... It's evening here and glad we can make it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apologies for it. And there, are, there might be a few delays, but that's fine. We're going to work with that. But yeah, it's 10 o'clock in the morning here, mate. What time is it there? Uh, 7 p.m. Ah, 7 p.m. So you'll probably be going to bed soon and yeah, <laughs> we're just having breakfast. <laughs> yeah, it won't, be too, won't be too far away. The big training week ahead as usual. Yeah, yeah. We'll kind of kind of come back to that now, actually, because I know you've told me a little bit about that. But um, I think first and foremost, Matt, mate, I mean, again, thank you so much for coming on. Me and you have, you know, chatted a little bit and 
uh, got to know a little bit about each other before this and um, massively admire you and everything you've done, mate. And I just want, obviously, the listeners to know more about you because um, if they don't know about you, I want them to. <laughs> so um, just um, can you tell us a bit about yourself? And uh, I know that from previous podcasts you talked about this a lot, but obviously, so sorry to make you repeat yourself, but just a bit about your your life and um, how you've come to the stage, really, and it's a bit about you. Yeah, thanks, mate. Uh, it has been super nice um, chatting over Instagram mainly and uh, for social media and all its ills. I've uh, been super grateful to be able to meet super cool people like all around the world and and in our travels and and racing, get to have the opportunity to meet up with some of them and, and, uh, and go on training runs and uh, it's been super rad. So, yeah, it's great to to catch up with you guys and um, – Man, I, that's a big question to and a very long answer to start with. But uh, I guess um, currently, I, as you said, like we own a couple of uh, specialty coffee shops, and uh, I'm a husband and dad of two daughters. So I've got a 14 year old and 11 year old girls, and we're in that stage of life that it seems like very, very busy, uh, busier than it's been. Uh, up to this point and so yeah so they've got a lot of stuff going on with uh, life in general and sports and social stuff and school and all those things so that's certainly a juggling act um, my wife has her own business hairdressing and she works late a couple of days a week uh, Monday through Wednesday so uh, I'm doing the run around and um, sometimes doing doubles in between uh, dancing and soccer and bits and pieces. And uh, yeah, so that's sort of the family and the business. Um, I also try and make this running thing uh, a extremely, extremely, extremely low paying business uh, <laughs> with, a, with a little bit of sponsor stuff and uh, and some uh, a little bit of coaching and um yeah, but I think if you worked it out at an hourly rate, I'm probably on 0. 0.0000, <laughs> lots of zero ones cent an hour. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, so in between all that, um, trying to fit in sort of in the realm of fifteen to twenty plus hours a week of training, and uh, and yeah, just trying to trying to juggle that and work and then uh social and not that there's a whole lot of time my social life is sort of through our coffee shops which is super sweet um get to catch up with all our friends and and hang it's not really work going going to the shop is the fun part it's all the the other stuff that's tough but uh yeah so um yeah and just the occasional you know gig and trip away and then always planning for the next holiday and adventure um or race in between Sweet. I wanted to ask you just quickly that you mentioned obviously you got two daughters. Um, obviously, I know that obviously you've you've taken part in a lot of sports throughout your early life. I've read into that, and um, obviously you went you know, did the gym thing and everything before you took on the ultra running. With you, your two girls, do you see any kind of traits in your girls that maybe it, that that you had? Like, can you see them picking up sports like yourself, or have they got any interest in running? Yeah, it's interesting uh, as a as parents, my wife runs as well, but I was personally super conscious not to try and push them into, into anything. Um, just sort of let them try different stuff. And I've listened to a number of podcasts about, you know, generalists and um, specialists and just sort of letting them be that generalist uh, in life and in activities until they find something that they really, um, you know, struck a chord with. So they're both reasonably um, active and as I mentioned, they're into dancing. My young one, she's, she's pretty uh, good at whatever she picks up. So she's really got into soccer and or football as you guys call it. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and she's doing really well at that. So um, I never thought I'd be a, a soccer dad, but I, I really enjoy watching her play and, and trying to support her in that. And um, so, yeah, it's really good seeing her sort of, she's got to the point where she's made some representative teams and she's starting to sort of want to do her own training and stuff, which is different to, you know, anything she's sort of done in the past. So that's really cool to see. And, um, 
you know, as far as running goes, if they want to, if they want to go for a run, you know, we certainly encourage them to be uh, active and, and get out and be moving and doing stuff as much as they can. Uh, and if that means coming for a run or, you know, doing something with us or a family bike ride or uh, anything, then, you know, that's all a bonus. So, um, yeah, just trying to help them find what they want to do. I mean, you know, I think deep down as a runner, you always hope for the day that your kids might um, want to run with you. I've got a good relationship with my dad through running now. And, um, you know, I'd love to be able to do that one day. But if if they don't want to do that and they as long as they're active, I don't really care and they're, and they're moving their bodies. So that's the most important thing. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good lead into. So Nath, uh, obviously, he's his he's about to take on the entire Welsh coastal path, which is eight hundred and eighty miles, um, and he's going to try and beat the FKT, which is what seventy is seventeen days, Nath. Seventeen days, yeah. And um, yeah, his his son is going to be running. How much with him? He wants to do at least ten um, k every day. So mm -hmm. I'll try and try and break it up to him, and, and obviously we got to think of like uh, where we're actually running because I don't want to be having him running on the edge of a cliff, <laughs> or um, having a section where it's like miles from like the next checkpoint, or where we can drop him off to my parents. So yeah, mm -hmm. he's looking to do anything he can really, which is going to mm -hmm. be cool. And your your daughter's what professional Welsh rugby player. Yeah, she's out in Italy at the moment uh, with the under twenties. Um, yeah, she's been playing since she was age five. Incredible! She, she's so driven; it's just crazy. I love that. Amazing. I, I hope that my cool. Sorry, Matt. I just saying that's super cool. It's like, yeah, that's so great that they're able to do that with you, and um, yeah, those those memories are certainly, uh, you know, if if you make the well when you make the run um i think those k's with your son will probably be the the, the thing that you'll remember not not necessarily even finishing the yeah totally agree or getting the fkt it'll be spending that time with you with your kid. yeah yeah yeah, yeah that'll be they'll be the memories and they'll be hopefully what he remembers as well like he'll be able to look back at that and have all these photos and done something incredible. There's not many people who, who will ever get the chance to run the Welsh coastal path. So to do that with his son is incredible. I hope that I hope that my little boy he I mean he follows after me already. I think he'll be sporty in some way. But like like you said, Matt, I'm not going to push him at the end of the day. As long as he enjoys what he does and he does it with heart, that's fine by me. <clears throat> For sure. You're in Soon, yeah, Nathan. Is Nathan Have sorry? It. Yeah, yeah. I'll get what was that, Matt? You're heading off soon, yeah. Yeah, um, I leave. Um, I'm heading to Chester, which is North Wales, next Friday. I start on Saturday, the twentieth. And what's the goal per day? Um, <laughs> I can't say because other people do the record as well. But I'll message <laughs> yeah, <right>. you after. <laughs> Fair enough. Sounds good. I like that. It's good to keep your cards close to your chest sometimes, that's for sure. Exactly, yeah. Oh. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, Matt, so, I mean, man, you've, me and Nate were talking about before you came on, we've listened to your TED Talk, I've read and listened to pretty much all the podcasts I can find on you, uh, read into you and stuff, and you've done some unbelievable runs, like, unreal runs. And um, like, for example, the one that again sticks out to me, similar to what we've just been talking about, is you ran, was it 500 kilometers from Brisbane to Bundaberg and back with your dad? Is that something you did? Yeah, that was, um, first of all, super kind that you've uh, taken the time to listen to my nonsense uh, and <laughs> and stuff I've done, mate. But I uh, appreciate that. But um. Yeah, that was actually one of the first things we did. We that was, you know, talk about doing stuff with your parents or um, you know, your kid. Uh my dad sort of got me into I was a runner in school, but my dad got me into running uh once I sort of decided to stop doing the gym and I very quickly found ultra marathon running after doing my first marathon and uh that was through I think a lot of people um through Dean Carnesi's book ultramarathon man and um that 
that completely changed the trajectory of my life. And that was probably about 17 years ago now. And uh, we very quickly got into doing some ultra marathons and had no idea what we were doing. And uh, my dad, a few years uh, prior, had uh, had had prostate cancer, and we decided to to do this run uh, to fundraise for Beyond Blue. And um, it's a you know there's an Australian foundation that it's for men's mental health and for uh, prostate cancer awareness. So we just come with this idea that again, no idea what we're doing, that we're going to run to Brisbane and back. And uh, we decided to do it like a like a tag team relay. So we would do uh, the first, I think we did the first 5K together each day and then the last 5K together each day and then whatever is in the middle, we'd split. Um, so yeah, so we ended up doing, I think it was close to 500K each in, I guess it was around 20 days. So the the kilometers were extremely manageable. It was... I look at it now and I'm like, it's, you know, at the time it was extremely difficult, but I look at it now and I'm like, it was, it was pretty easy going, but, uh, you know, when you, <laughs> when you dream and you don't know what you're doing and, uh, it was, a, it was a really cool experience and the family was all involved and, uh, my wife was actually, uh, about seven months pregnant with our first daughter. And I strongly suggest anyone thinking about doing something like that with your wife, seven months pregnant in the crew van uh not a good idea <laughs> don't. <laughs> don't so so you know we learned some um, valuable lessons about crewing and about um, managing multi-day events and uh, i guess it you know it really lit the fire for uh, i love racing but i also love uh, multi-day self-organized um, adventure style runs as well so uh, that's certainly been a constant through you know the last 17 odd years of of my running adventures incredible so it was had you done like um because I, I i obviously read that you you were into your weightlifting in gym and stuff but you took up running because you wanted to do something with your dad so had you done many bigger runs prior to that or was it um like like what did you do halves and marathons and stuff within prior or did you go straight into the 500k <laughs> it was it was pretty quick like we um you know, I did. I decided to do my first marathon. I was sort of lifting, sort of phasing out of that and running at the same time. And I did my first marathon, and I was, uh, I was sort of about the same. No, I wasn't quite as lean as I am now, but I was 103 kilos. Uh, so I was a, a pretty big boy, and um, and it was extremely difficult. So I did the first marathon, and then I think we did a, I think we did a 50k, and then uh. It was called the North Face 100, which is now called UTA Australia. Um, so we did that. And then, look, I want to say it was pretty quick. There might have been a couple of other, you know, halves or um, maybe a couple of marathons in there, but it was pretty quick that we then just jumped in and thought running to Brisbane and back was a cool idea. <laughs> and did, How was your relationship with your dad during that? Because, I mean, I love my parents. And uh, as I've got older, I've... I've my relationship with my dad has gotten a lot closer. Um, not that it was terrible before, but I think it just does. It's one of those things. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I'll ever be able to do anything like that with him. Um, but I mean, did did it like did it strengthen your relationship? Yeah, we are. Uh, we certainly had our struggles when I was in school, and um, you know, we had different ideas on uh, on how to, you know. I guess raise a family like he he had good intention and he his way to show us he loved us was to work super hard and um he's a concreter so he's you know he's had his own business for a lot of years and that sort of cause and my immaturity you know as a kid caused some tension between the two of us because I sort of wanted him around but you know he was mum was home and and he had to work so that was certainly difficult through school but then uh straight after school I actually was an exchange student uh in finland and um so way up north of you guys and uh and through that year i think we both sort of did a lot of thinking and and growing and uh our relationship started to sort of mend then and then you know through me getting back into sport and the gym and stuff like it our relationship slowly started to improve but then when i decided to sort of take up running he'd been running marathons and stuff sort of since I left school. So it would have been, you know, a period of 
five or six years before I started. And, uh, you know, when I asked him to do that training program for me and, and showed an interest sort of in what he was doing in his world, uh, that's when, you know, things sort of really went, uh, you know, and, and accelerated our relationship, I guess. So, uh, yeah, so that was fantastic. So, you know, that through running, um, dad and I have done some pretty cool stuff. Like he, he has done a lot of really cool things in his own right. And, uh, to work the way that he does and, and still train and finish races is it's beyond me. Like I've done enough of that work with him to know that, uh, when you finish a day of concreting, you do not want to go running, um, especially <laughs> in Australia in the heat. And, and he, you know, he, he just does it and he, he loves it. Like it's, it's been a little bit difficult in the last few years. He's had a few uh, health issues and, and it's been hard watching him not be able to run and train and, and race and do the things that he really loves. Cause, cause he just thrives being part of a community and, and, you know, I think it's as much his identity as it is mine. Um, so that's been a little hard and it's, it's hard to remember sometimes that he's 70 when only a few years ago, you know, he was, he was trying to run 200 miles and, uh, and, you know, but, but having him along for, you know, he, you know, I think the relationship has changed a little bit now. Like I'm trying to take on these really massive sort of adventure things. And, and he's usually the first one on board to crew. Uh, and, um, sometimes that brings its own stresses. Uh, he, he's, he's a bit of a warrior and stressor and I'm like super casual and just like, let's just roll with the punches. So that, that can be a bit hard sometimes, but, um, you know, he, he's got best intentions at heart and, um, you know, only a few months ago, uh, before the Noosa ultra trail 100 K, uh, I decided to run to the start line, um, which was, uh, it was 255 K. So in three days, um, ran to the start line of the hundred K and, and he crewed for me. So it was just a little adventure that he and I went on and slept in the back of my van and, um, <laughs> yeah, super cool. So sort of things have changed and molded over the years and he's still, you know, he's still wanting to run up. Uh, there's a hundred K in October that um, he's done uh, eight times and he's <laughs> freaking determined to get a 10 time finisher there that uh, he turns 70 in October. So, you know, hundred K well, when you're 70 is uh, with a fair bit of verts, not, not mucking around. So ho hopefully he can get the job done. What a legend. You you made some serious memories with your dad and your family, mate. This is that's what life's about, man. That's incredible. It makes me very jealous. And you know, it's quite funny. I've got to say something here. Uh, this is not a weird thing to say, but I see a lot of thing, characteristics and traits in you that I have as well. It's quite strange because, I mean, I haven't been in ultra running long. I've, I've not achieved anything that you have. You'd like it, well, in kind of that, you know, the amount of races you've done that will come in time, but. You know, the tattoos, the lover of music. Um, I wanted to be in a band and travel the world. I was in a band for a while. We were doing well. And I actually came to Australia for a year and travelled and left the band and never went back. And lots of things that you've said are very similar to my, the thinking is similar to me. Like, And then you mentioned your dad had prostate cancer. Mine currently has prostate cancer and he's doing really well. But yeah, it's just a th every time you say, you say these things, I'm like... Holy shit, please. Very similar to me. <laughs> it's crazy. There's a lot of things going on, but um, it's a small world, man. It like it really is. Like, um, and that's you know going back to what I said at the start. Like that's what I think is so great about uh, social media. It's you know, for all its curses, it's it's amazing to be able to connect with people that you know we wouldn't have had the opportunity 10, 20 years ago to to be able to do this, to be able to um, become friends with people on the other side of the world and um you know even when i was like reposting your posts this afternoon i'm like oh man i'm doing a podcast in the uk it's like it's so rad and uh <laughs> yes yeah, such, such a cool opportunity but um just to touch on uh and you know appreciate the kind words again man but just to touch on that what you're saying like i'm i'm super super grateful like my um my wife is like and my family in general but my wife particularly is uh, incredibly understanding and supportive of, of what I do. And, uh, it's, you know, we, we've been married for a long time. We got married at 18 and 19 and, uh, you know, our lives have, um, woven together, you know, over 22 years this year. And, and she, she knows how important 
what I do is to me and, and she, she appreciates that. And, and she's very understanding of, of letting me do my thing. And, you know, and I, and I make sacrifices uh, to, to support that as well. You know, I don't, sorry, it's my dog. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get up like crazy early, but you know, I, I choose to do that. So the training hopefully impacts the family as little as possible. And, and my kids are the same, you know, they've been coming to races from, you know, as I mentioned before, in Tegan's stomach when she was pregnant, like they've been coming to, you know, they're at U my eldest one was at UTA when she was maybe nine months old and uh and they've been able to experience amazing things uh and see amazing places in Australia and around the world through through my running that uh that ninety nine percent of kids around the world wouldn't have. So uh it's it's it is a really unique uh experience and and situation and I'm I'm super grateful because I and I don't take it for granted because I know not everybody has that luxury and a lot of people butt heads with their partners and um they don't get what they do. So I, I'm I'm super grateful for that. Yes. Having a it's I think over the years, like I've always run and done silly things and what have you, like whether it was running or not, but Prior to doing running and or taking the ultra side more seriously, I was doing big bike rides and stuff for charities. And I think over the years, my wife has slowly started to realise that ah, okay, this this is this is a thing. This is what Reese does. Like it's just it took a while. I think only because she's and this isn't taking anything away from her. She doesn't run. She despises running. She literally hates it. She likes gym yoga everything else and she stays active but i just think it took a while for her to understand that like you want to do what you want to run a hundred what it, to, to her she couldn't compute it but now i think and regardless of her thought process on it she's always there at the finish line she's always there supporting me and um it's yeah i think it's important to have that person isn't it i mean it's it's just surrounding yourself with positive people. If you're not married, just surrounding yourself with positive people, and positive friendships and groups. And as you've touched on a few times, having, I mean, like I said, you're sat in Australia right now. I've never met you before. And we're talking about this now. And it feels like I've known you for ages. You've got the running community is incredible worldwide and, and it's so supportive. And I think that helps a lot as well. Um, but I just wanted to, to touch on, you mentioned your training and stuff as well. Um, out of curiosity so with your training especially when you've got big runs coming up and we're going to come back to them in a sec but I'm curious how hard do you push in training I know it sounds like a bit of a, a weird question but on race day obviously every stride is a, is like an effort obviously because it's, you know, you, you're out there it's race day you've got your game face on um, and a lot of people go hard but do you train that way or how does your training week look do you like mimic the day or? Yeah, it's, again, that's a, it's a pretty big question because, you know, over, over the time I've been running, it's really evolved and, um, and changed and, and you build up a certain amount of resilience to, to training as well. Uh, I guess I'll lead off by saying um, I'm, I've sort of, put a lot of thought into this recently. I'm not a competitive person at all. Uh, I'm a, I'm competitive with myself. Uh, and um, in a race, you know, like if I'm putting out as much effort as I can and know um, that, you know, it's 70K into a 100 miler uh, and somebody goes past me, uh, I'm not going to chase them because experience says that, well, I've got a little saying that uh, in a 100 miler, the race doesn't start till 100K. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm not interested until 100K. Um, uh, so yeah, so I guess that how hard I push in training, um, it's a little dependent and unique to where I live as well. So a lot of the races that I do, are mountainous ultra trails. Um, so the recent big races I've done have either been at altitude or included altitude and or a lot of climbing. Um, I live in, ex in an extremely flat town. Uh, we have one hill that's, depending on what you look at, it's 96 or 98 metres above sea level. Uh, <laughs> and trails, I don't have the luxury to get to very very often, just 
due to sheer time and you know not wanting you know, the closest trails really are probably by the time I drive there and get running it's probably an hour um so you know I I know I need to get there and I should but to to go there and do like a let's say a four to six hour run you put an hour on each side you know on your day off when you want to spend it with your family and you you know I just I'm just not always willing to do that um and that happens every now and then so I guess to answer your question in how how hard I push, uh, I've always, uh, I was an extremely early um, lover and still am and uh, advocate of uh, all that Anton does. So um, it hasn't worked out so well for him uh, now, but uh, but I've always subscribed to to high volume and um, and sort of low intensity. So. I certainly do a little bit of effort and speed work here and there. Uh, but my sort of thinking is, if you know, like this is a whole nother podcast, but um, my <laughs> personal opinion is that if you're going to train for a long race, you need to run a lot. Uh, and most of it needs to be at a conversational easy pace. So, yeah. you know, so what I, so what I used to do 10 years ago, um, you know, I used to, if I used to do a couple of weeks of a hundred miles in a row, I'd start to get niggles and, and that was too much. Um, whereas now, you know, I'm on this thing at the moment where the last couple of races and leading into my next race, I'm doing like a hundred mile week plus blocks. So it's like 160 to 200, 210 K week blocks. And then I'm also including, uh, you know, two to four five thousand meters of climbing on that one hill so yeah so it's you know you got to get creative and i've had certainly had i've had a step i've got a step machine in my shed uh i've been dragging a tire around that one hill with a uh with a training mask on um looking like Hannibal Lecter uh so you know intensity and how hard i work is i guess relative um to me i love high volume uh it it does take up more time but i think more than anything for me mentally i need to be doing and putting in big blocks before big races uh to be mentally prepared i i personally would find it really difficult to go into a 100 miler and have only run 90k weeks uh, you know, 100k weeks. That's and that's not taking anything away from anybody that does that because I know you can complete a hundred miler on way less training than I do. Uh, I'm just speaking from my own personal experience. I just find that if I can put in, you know, before my last race, I had a great block leading into that Noosa race where I ran into it where, that I was speaking about, and then I had a few little build weeks after resting for a bit, and then I did four weeks of between 100 and 200k with uh, sorry, between 160K and 200K with a heap of climbing, a four-week block. I think I worked out, I did like 700K and 11,000 meters of vert in four weeks. And I was like, oh, I'm freaking ready to go. So <laughs> that's a really long way of answering your question. But uh, how hard I work in training, it's, it's relative. So for a normal person to run 100 miles a week is very difficult, but it's, you know, it's very difficult for me to get my head around running a really hard 5k so you know like it's hard is such a yeah it's a, it's a different term yeah yeah Broad word. yeah it is i know what you mean because i i can't stand the thought of uh, have you heard of parkrun they have parkrun in australia don't they yeah, yeah of course yeah so um, yeah it's, i didn't know it was a worldwide thing but uh, it was uh, yeah it's uh the I, i've never done one and I do run 5Ks if I'm, you know, I haven't got any time and I have to, you know, bang out 5K before work or wherever. But I mean, I wouldn't go out of my way to enter the park run to do it because I just think it's. We discussed this on the very first episode, me and Nathan did about. I reckon it's probably one of the hardest distances, 5 and 10K, because you just you just go so hard that you either you're either blown out your ass really quickly or. You take your time, and then by the end of it, you're trying to play catch up, and it's just it's just horrible distances. Like again, not taking that away from anybody who does it, I admire people who do it and do it very quickly. But 
I'd much rather lease up and just run at my own pace for a long time. That, that's more of a me thing. And I think that's probably probably speak for both of you actually there as well. Um, yeah, it's a bit multi, it's a bit multifaceted too. Like every year at the start of the year, I set set goals as far as what I want to achieve for the year. And this year I set a goal of running a, a sub 20 minute 5k, um, which I've only actually had a go at on New Year's Day. So it was the first day of the year. Uh, and I, and it was in the middle of a medium length run. And I think I ran, uh, I think it was like 22 and a half or I don't know, something like that. But, um, you know, like you've got to put time and speed work and effort and focus into doing that. And yeah. like, I just don't want to do that. Like it, <laughs> there might, there might come a time where I do, but at the moment, like it's, and you're trying to explain that to like a normal person that, that people just think running is running. I'm like, you got no idea. Like running a 5k is like, I can't explain to you the kind of pain that is. I'm like, I would much prefer, like I have slow burn tattooed on me. I'm like, I just want to go and run for 20 hours and it'll just come. Like I'm not, I'm not interested in like 20 minutes of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. It's so true, isn't it? It sucks. Like I've done one sub 20 minute 5k. And to this day, I don't even know if my Strava was working properly because some of the, the times I were hitting just felt unnatural, but it was like 19 minutes 50 or something. And I could taste blood afterwards. I was like in severe pain, like on the floor. Like, like a, a woman walked past me walking a dog and had to stop and ask if I was okay because I physically have never been so out of it. Like, I looked dead. She must have thought I was dying because I was all having a heart attack. And and then people are like, oh, that's awesome. You're going to try and beat it. No, absolutely not. I, I have no intention of doing that ever again. That was horrible. But like you said, it's strange. It, Nate's going to go and run 880 miles. <laughs> It's, it's, it's just yeah. it's just weird how we yeah it's you know, people are different but i'm glad we are all different and then um, i think i've been wanting to have a go at a fast marathon for a long time i've got a lot of friends that are, that are marathoners and uh and and i don't know how like i've never run a uh, all a marathon and like i've got an idea on what i could run but you know i'd have to set aside like to do it properly like four to six months to train and do it properly and you probably have to do a couple hard marathons to get it right. And I'm like, like more power to people who do that because again, you you know, like there's so little room for error. But I just don't want to dedicate that time to doing like I I'm at a time, you know, I'm sort of at an age where uh, where ultra and like really long stuff is is prime for the taking. And uh, and you know, I've got a massive history that to build on that and to dedicate that time for a marathon. I'm I might one day, but at the moment, I'm I'm pretty keen to keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> you get it, man. I get it. Matt, um, when you um, go out for these long runs, especially races, do you follow a nutrition plan, like a fueling plan, or do you, do you just wing it? And so, like, go by feel. In the races itself, mate? Yeah. Yeah, that, that again is a you know, changed and, and ebbed and flowed over the years. Uh, and I've had a lot of some successes and some epic failures. Uh, and it's, I, I used to sort of think that that kind of thing was pretty universal, but the longer I go, the more I realize that it's, it's so individual and, and what will work for some won't work for others. So I, uh, yes, I do to, to answer the question. Um, and it's something that, that I certainly am trying to train and, and doing in training. Um, in recent years, I've actually had some reasonable issue with, with some stomach slash reflux type uh, episodes. And it's been, it's been quite frustrating because I used to be able to get away with pretty much eating whatever and, you know, having a plan, but, just jamming whatever in my face and as long as it was vegan then there was no real drama it would just it would go fine uh but i don't know if it's an age thing or the length of time i've been running or i'm not sure what to put it down to 
it seems to be a little trickier these days um, with what I can and can't put in. Uh, as a general rule, now don't take don't take this as science or uh, try and follow it yourself. But um, as a general rule for me, I have like a fifteen minute alarm set on my on my watch. Uh, I have a uh, in long runs. Um, so I, sorry, just to backtrack a little, I've, I've sort of, um, again, the, you know, deep diving on Anton over the years, I've done the, uh, the sort of fat adapted stuff. So I'll head out, you know, I get up most days when I'm in big weeks between, you know, three and three thirty, and I won't eat before I go and I'll do up to, you know, two hours, um, just with water. Uh, and then, once I go beyond water, uh, once I go beyond two hours, uh, typically in training, I won't eat before I go, uh, but I will take on, um, I've like most people I've, I've subscribed to the, the liquid nutrition thing. So I'll have some liquid nutrition every 15 minutes, have a couple of sips of that and a couple of sips of water. Little tip from my dentist because my teeth are not great because of, uh, I do have a very sweet tooth, but also from sports nutrition, if you're drinking liquid nutrition, carry water with you and in between every sip, wash your mouth out with water and um, get the sugar off your teeth. Little tip for young players out there. Um, Interesting. I digress. Uh, but uh, yeah, so a bit of, a bit of sports nutrition um, every 15 minutes uh, with some water. And then um, I aim for... Uh, something solid every 45 minutes and I'm still, you know, like I'm listening to all the science that's happening and, you know, particularly with cyclists taking on a lot of calories an hour now, cycling is very different to running. Obviously they're not bouncing like we are, yeah. uh, but typically I'm aiming for, you know, you two, everyone wants to talk in carbs now. I don't know when this changed, like ultra running was always calories. So I, I'm still a bit confused, but anyway, it's, I'm, um, you know, two to 300 calories an hour. Um, and uh, my hydration plan, it's typically I'm aiming for a bottle an hour. Um, so it's like 500 mil of uh, water and sports nutrition. Um, but it's extremely weather dependent here uh, in Australia. So I can, you know, I can take one bottle for two hours here and come back reasonably like not really dehydrated in winter and um if i took one bottle in summer uh i'd be pretty cooked by the end so it's um it's very dependent on the weather and um yeah but that's sort of the basic and you know in races i'll take uh i'll take my personal nutrition in between aid stations and then at aid stations typically i'm eating um maybe like well in my, my last race for example i was having like pots and noodles, um, like burritos with like rice and beans and veg and stuff. Um, some like, so you call it soft drink, soda, soft drink every now and then. Uh, <laughs> and when I, you know, I try and push caffeine as long as I can. So I try and push caffeine, uh, to, you know, after a hundred K, um, if possible. Um, and not till I'm getting like tired, like sleepy tired, um, and that's again, dependent on what time of the day the race starts. So, um, yeah, that's sort of the basics. And the last race, I was really just trying to get, you know, at aid stations, get as much in as I could and, and everything was going like the best nutritionally, like best nutrition race I've had in a very long time up until 125 K and my legs were good and I was ready to run. And then my stomach went to crap and then it was a death march for <laughs> death march shuffle so still learning and still trying to figure it out yeah i'm glad you asked actually Neith, about that because i had that as a question obviously you're vegan and I'm, I'm, i wonder um like in terms of you being um obviously an ultra runner and a vegan athlete how has that impacted your running performance like do, or do, do you like I suppose more an easier way to put that is: Do you ever struggle to eat at checkpoints during races, like based on your diet, or is it something that you kind of you pre-plan for? Like, do you take any homemade food with you or anything like that, just in case? 
Yeah, it's, I've been doing it for nearly 11 years now. So it's kind of second nature. Like, I think like anything new, when you start, you it's a lot of work and you're super conscious and it's like always on your mind. Whereas now, like the way I eat is, it's just the way I eat. And uh, I don't think too much about it. You know, I do, I do take my own stuff, um, but you know, you can always get watermelon, potatoes, salted potato chips. Um, most noodles in Australia are uh, are vegan, um, some exceptions, obviously. Uh, but and then if there's any anything particular that I want, yeah, I, I definitely take my own stuff. Um, when I do like multi day stuff, like that run the news I did, my mum made like a heap of stuff, so. Uh, you know, we had like banana breads and little muffins and um, slice and different stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's just a little bit, it's not like a massive drama. And a lot of the sports nutrition products, um, are by default vegan anyway. Like, um, I've just been experimenting a bit with the precision stuff, and yes, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure all their stuff is vegan. Um, everything that I've used and checked is, um, yeah, so it's not like it's not like a massive drama and it's certainly i think if anything it's it's helped uh my performance and recovery over time i i still hold true that i don't know if i'd be able to train and recover recovery definitely seems to be my like my superpower i'd like i'm not a genetically gifted runner uh i'm not the greatest runner by any means but um i can back up you know, day after day after day and, and, and keep churning out K's. And I think that's got a lot to do with um, probably my diet and also being on my feet all day at work probably helps as well. And mm. yeah. That's cool. Uh, well, man, I, we've kind of uh, not come around to it yet. So I want to talk about some of the research you've done. I mean, we have to, I will be here all week if we, we start going through all of them. Cause I know you've done a fair few, but a couple of the standout ones, mate. I mean, I think you're the first person I've ever spoken to that's done Leadville. I mean, I, I know you've done some, you've recently done the Brisbane Ultra Trail 100, um, which we'll come to as well. But just to talk about some of your previous ones, I mean, any standout ones that you want to talk about? Or like that for uh, Leadville has to be one of them that's up there, surely. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was actually thinking today, I was. I was mowing my lawn this afternoon. I, I do my best thinking when I'm on the lawn. And uh, I was like, I really need to update my website and I really need to like put together a good list of like, it's hard, right? Like you don't want ego attached to things, but you know, I feel like I've done some pretty cool stuff over the years and, uh, and it'd be nice to have it all in one place. And, you know, I think just as time goes on, you just do what you do and you don't think to record it. Um, but yeah, but uh, I mean, as a general overview, I mean, I don't even know really how you technically count things now because like, you know, do you count ultra marathons and marathons that you do in training as ultra marathon? Like, I don't know. I don't know where the line is there, um, but I don't know. Like a lot of races, um, I don't even know how many hundred mile plus races I've done, I, I guess. I guess it'd have to be like over 20 races over a hundred miles. Um, but you know, you talk about standouts. Um, yeah, there certainly has been a few, um, before I get to that, I just, I guess I'd like to just like, again, talking about family, like we originally started and it was like races were like a big thing, you know, like you go to races and so it's big to do and, you know, we still enjoy going to races and it's still definitely a family thing and it's like, you know, an organized thing. Whereas uh, you know, as the kids have got older, we put you know, we put a lot of focus on on travel and we try and live reasonably, you know, reasonably simply in normal life and we value experience and travel more than anything. So whether that's travel to races in Australia um or travel abroad uh with our family and you know we all experienced the whole uh covid hoo-ha and um through, through towards the end of that uh 
my wife and I had our um, 20 year wedding anniversary and we were sort of trying to decide where, where we wanted to go. We didn't really know. We just knew we wanted to do like a cool family, like big trip. And, um, <laughs> and my wife, uh, whether she regrets saying it now or not, I don't know, but she was basically like, well, why don't you, you know, we did Leadville pre COVID and it was like the best holiday we've ever had. So why don't you just try and get into a race, one of these races on your bucket list. And if you get in, we'll plan a holiday around it. So that's literally now our, uh, our holiday planning is, um, you know, I've got a list of races that I want to do and, and, you know, I, I pick one of them. I try and, you know, well, I don't pick one. I try and pick a couple and try and get into them because we all know how hard races are to get into now. Uh, and if I get in, then, you know, then we plan a holiday around it. We save, we, you know, and we, and we work towards that. So that's a long way of saying uh, I'm in a fortunate position now where uh, I can start ticking off some of those um, bucket mm -hmm. lists if I can get in. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So in recent times, um, last year I did uh, Lavaredo, um in Italy, um, which was uh, a terrible experience because I was sick for about 20 hours um, oh, of, the 20, of the 22 hours. So um, it was suffering in paradise because that is an incredible race. Uh, that was a highlight. Um, Leadville, you know, I was... Um, I was a very early uh, disciple of Born to Run and um, I've done a marathon barefoot. I ran in sandals. I've done 240 kilometer races, 100 mile trail races in sandals. Um, I ran only in sandals for like seven years. So anyone that's read Born to Run knows that Leadville is a prominent uh, feature in that book. So getting the opportunity to run Leadville in, in 2019 and have a holiday around that was it, it was literally a dream come true. Like it would, it was like, you know, I got to meet barefoot Ted and, you know, like it was, it was just the, one of the most romantic, amazing experiences. You know, I literally cried dry, driving into Boulder because I, you know, every single thing I watch and read and follow, uh, you know, is, is freaking in Boulder. Um, I tried yeah. to find Tony, but he's a ghost. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Leadville was awesome. Um, I'm talking too much, but uh, no, I have to jump uh, in there actually and say, you, you know, you mentioned the Ultra Marathon Man book. That is, that was one of the staple books that I read that really made me think, like, this is insane. Like, how people push their body to, to such limits. I need to, I need me some of that. Um, and also Born to Run. So when you, I was going to bring it up earlier on, I forgot. And when you just mentioned it then, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that book. But it's incredible. And if nobody's read it, it's like the whole story and everything around it. So, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean about that, man. Incredible. Yeah. Yes, that was that was amazing. Um, and then I guess a few other things. Uh, I, um, I was training and preparing uh, for a run across the country. Um, and in lead up to that, I did, um, I did a hundred half marathons in a row. And then the year after I did, um, 40 marathons and 10, 50 K days in a row. Uh, so that were like a couple of cool lead up, um, things that I did for the, for the run across Australia. Um, and then, you know, like a, there's been a few special hundred milers I'd, I won the inaugural, um, we have an event here called the Buffalo Stampede, which is like three really mountainous uh, ultras over three days. Um, and that was a really cool experience. I don't know if they thought anybody would actually finish and um, and I got the job done, so that was cool. Uh, and then like a couple of other cool things, I every now and then I like to do uh, things that are completely out of my wheelhouse and I... And I and really have have no business doing so. Um, a few years back, I did uh, I did Ultraman, um, so I hadn't I hadn't swam a lap and I hadn't done a triathlon. Well, yeah, I don't think I'd swam a lap and I hadn't done a triathlon in twenty years, and I managed to wiggle my way into Ultraman Australia and and finish that. Uh, and then I've done a two hundred mile gravel bike ride and uh with some mates and um. And yeah, a whole heap of other that, as I mentioned earlier, that run to Noosa with Dad, 
um, before running that event. Um, I did my own self organized, uh, 200 mile run to, to try and raise some coin for, to open our business because the bank wouldn't give us money and we, we couldn't get cash to, so it is a bit of a GoFundMe thing. Um, and yeah, and like, you know, I say all that to, to say like, I love racing and I love adventuring, but to me, if I couldn't train and I couldn't, you know, if I could just click my fingers and do a race or an event, it wouldn't interest me. Um, I really enjoy the the cathartic experience of of the day to day training and the grind and you know working yourself in the ground and um, and getting up day after day and and doing it. So every as I mentioned before, every year I set training goals and um, and things that I want to experience in training. And this year, even after you know, as I said, seventeen years, this year I've set my most um, audacious goals as far as training goes and and volume and it's it's cool it's it really it really uh it really lifts me up and and makes me happy that i can still be this far into a journey and and still be learning and and getting better and and improving and uh yeah it's it's been a it's been a cool experience i hope that wasn't all too boring <laughs> Have you got any ambition to uh, do the Dragons back here in Wales? I I was actually, again, while I was mowing, I was like thinking about whether you guys are going to be like, you should come to the UK and do a race. I know I know about the Dragon back. And if anyone wants to pay for me to come and do it, I'm all for it. <laughs> I, I think it's I can a... see another GoFundMe uh, run coming up here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. And do you know what though? If it's 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 difficult because it is expensive, and obviously with you being in Australia, it's not practical. But I mean, I got a friend who'd done it, and I I spoke to other people who've done it, and the way really to get around that is by volunteering at their events. If you volunteer at their events, you get an enormous discount, like more than half, uh, just to enter. But obviously. <laughs> you traveling across from Australia to volunteer and then travel is not exactly practical. But do you know what's really funny, Nate? I've literally, whilst Matt was talking, I got the Dragon's Back race up on my phone right now. Because <laughs> I was that was going to be my next question. I was going to say, would you consider doing the 380 kilometer six day Dragon's Back over here? Because the reason I wanted to bring that up as well is I've spoken about this with a few other people. I'd be interested to see how. You know, the likes of yourself, Matt, and, and some other great runners like, you know, Courtney DeWalders and all these people. I'd love to see how they get on with the Welsh terrain because the best of the best over here who are used to it, it's literally their stomping ground, struggle and DNF and, and can't do it. It's so tough. So I'd really like to that race to like to get more people from across the pond to come over and try it. So Maybe one day we'll look at organising that for you. Eh? We can, we'll do a just giving and get Matt Grills over here. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see um, if Lucy Bartholomew, uh, Lucy Bartholomew comes back. She was in uh, the Beacons over the weekend, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, she was here. Yeah, you you know about Lucy, I'm assuming, Matt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. think the biggest the biggest uh, deterrent for me is I'm not so keen on your weather over there, guys. Oh, it's miserable. Yeah, yeah it's miserable. Yeah. He just you adds to the do, beauty, though. Yeah, you've got to it's do it, winter. It's, it's winter here now, and I'm like, anyone that knows me, I'm like, I'm like usually super upbeat and like optimistic. I'm a misery guts in winter, and it's not even cold here. Like, I hate it. Like, this week, I think it's getting down to like five Celsius and like a top of like 19, and I'm hating life. I'm like, <laughs> what? That's, that's insane. terrible. Like, I mean, you, yeah, you, that's why I would like you guys to try that because you're used to the hotter kind of uh, climate and, and what have you. But again, on the flip side, if say me and Nathan decide to come over there and run 500 kilometers to, to you know, Noosa or something or whatever, we'd struggle because we'd be like, this is supposed to be winter. It is scorching. Like we're used to, High winds, you know, and, and freezing cold temperatures. I mean, it's supposed and to be the rain sunny. bouncing off the roads. Yeah, it's garbage here. Like last year, me and Nathan did a run, the one I've got coming up now, actually, the 50 miler. And um, it was August. 
and everyone was like, the year before they had a heat wave, and then last year, it, it, we were stood on the start line and the rain was bouncing off our heads and the roads, and it basically didn't stop for the entire time. It was the worst weather. In fact, he had to change the route because it was so dangerous. There was weather warnings, and we're like. It's fucking August, guys. What's going on? Mother Nature, be kind to us. Jesus. <laughs> but yeah. It doesn't um, so good to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it, I wanted to touch actually the one because you just kind of glazed over it, but I'm not having that. You mentioned <laughs> you run across the country. So correct me if I'm wrong here. And if, if I am wrong, I am really sorry. That was like one of your biggest dreams and you put all that training in. But it, did it didn't happen did it what actually happened yeah so this has been a really uh without getting too philosophical it's been a really interesting uh process over the last few years um and it's so i first i first blogged about uh wanting to run from the westernmost to the easternmost point of australia uh 13 years before i went and did it or went and attempted it so it had been a dream for like a really long time. Like, I think that might that might have been part of the problem with how it all panned out. But uh, I had this idea to run from uh, it's a place called um, Steep Point in Shark Bay, which is like you guys would think was the end of the Earth in the middle of nowhere. It li- it's like another planet uh, in Western Australia. Uh, and um, and run to the easternmost point, which is the the Cape Byron at um, at Byron Bay. Um, now, uh, to put it in perspective, I think it took us, from memory, five days to drive there, uh, and that was like massive driving days. So it's a long way. Uh, <laughs> so it was going to be the the plan that I derived and was training for was was to run hundred k a day for fifty days. And to finish on my 40th birthday. So it was it was uh 5,000 kilometers. And uh and I'm still yet to find anybody that's run from the westernmost to the easternmost point. It was going to be a first attempt, uh, an FKT, and um and there was a lot of energy and emotion put into into doing that event. Uh I got over there and uh and for whatever reason, we did the drive over. We were like everything was planned. Uh, I got um, uh, three and a half days in, and I'm I'm aware that I have this like genetic hip thing, uh, and hadn't caused any drama in training. Um, and three and a half days in, for whatever reason, whether it was sitting in the in the car for, you know, for five days. Um, I don't, I don't know what the reason was, whether it was the camber of the road, and you know, there's been a lot of thought process since coming back but um you know i persevered for another couple of days but uh, i pulled up on day five so um my mindset probably wasn't uh in some ways i wish i kind of would have stayed and and tried to just do the run um but in my mind i'd gone there to run 100k a day for 50 days uh, and anything less was a failure uh, and, um, and on day four, I, I failed. So that was the end of the the campaign as far as I was concerned. Um, that, that probably wasn't the right way to, to look at it. Um, but, it, but it is what it, what it is. And, you know, I toyed around with ideas of, you know, like biking and then running and then, but I was like, I'm not here to ride a gravel bike across Australia. I'm here to run. So, and I, and I failed at that. So, yeah, so since coming back, uh, I've got to be honest, like it 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 probably took me 12 to 18 months to to emotionally and mentally um, process that failure. Uh, I've also learned through the process that uh, people don't like the word failure and, um, and people want to make you feel good about your shortcomings. Uh, I'm not about that. Um, I'm, I'm, I failed at my attempt. I, I set out with a, with a really audacious goal. Um, and, and I didn't achieve that goal. And by definition, that's a failure and that's fine. Um, I think we mince words sometimes too much. Uh, and, you know, I've had to process that and it's, 
it still haunts me a little. Uh, I, I really want to go and have another go and, and approach it differently and just try and get it done. Um, but um, as I'm sure you can appreciate, uh, time, money, um, sponsorship, it's it's a lot. So if I go back, uh, you know, I've been next year, uh, will be three years since I was over there. So, you know, I've been toying with the idea of having another go, uh, but uh, I would certainly do it on a much lower key basis and and aim to run still big distance per day. But I've I think I could probably manage in the realm of about fifty miles a day. Um, I think that's probably pretty. I won't say like completely doable, but I think that's probably more manageable than than 100k a day. And yeah, it's it's a lot. Uh, it I still get a little emotional when I talk about it. Um, and uh, there were a lot of circumstances surrounding it too that um, that bitted the experience a little, uh, which I I won't really go into. But um, yeah, it's it's certainly been a hard thing to swallow, oh. and my hip hasn't caused me any issues since. So that's both great and really annoying. <laughs> yeah, it's been annoying. Uh, well, mate, you, Matt, you have to do it, man. You, you you have to get it. Whether it's next year or in five years, you've you've got to do that because that will just it will just haunt you for the rest of your life if you don't do it. And I, it is achievable. And I mean, I guess the psychology psychology of it. You said about doing hundred k a day. If you had to do like 50 miles a day um, and just see how you go on at that point, if you were struggling at that point, you can say, okay, I'm doing 50 today. But if you are feeling good, you can be pushed on and try and get that 100K, you know, because what's that? 100K is 62 miles, is it? Something like that. So I just do it how you feel, I guess. But you, I feel like that's something that you, you've got to achieve. And that sounds like and an if incredible you're not, having, if you're not having a good day, go with the mindset that, you know, you might just do 40 or 50K a day. Um, yeah. And just get it done. I'm I'm actually uh there's been a lot of people from Australia doing some pretty remarkable things at the moment. And uh I'm I'm mates with again, funnily enough, even though he lives in Australia, I'm social media mates with uh anybody that doesn't know Sean Bell, um S E A N uh Bell. He is mm -hmm. currently uh he'd have to be over 120 odd, he'd have to nearly be at 125 days in. Uh, he is he is going to break the record running around Australia. Um, he's been wow. averaging, yeah, he's been averaging. Yeah, I'd have to check, but his average would be close to eighty five k a day um, for one hundred and twenty plus days. Uh, and that guy, like, you want to talk about like incredible humans? Like that dude is he's the one of the most humble, like just just get it done like he there's no nonsense he's just a real good aussie guy and he just he's just going about his business with dignity and you know he's having a laugh and you know he's like multiple days he's like blood nose and vomit at the same time just like streaming out he'll give it a wipe and then like right let's go like so anyway, that's all to say if you don't follow Sean Bell, follow Sean Bell. And I'm actually um once all the hoo ha dies down after he finishes, I'm pretty keen to have a bit of a chat to him. Um there's another guy that uh that obliterated the record running from uh the traditional cross country route in Australia is um is Cottesloe Beach in Perth to Bondi in Sydney. Uh, it's not the extremities. I, I want to do the extremities. It does add a lot of distance on, but just my heart wants to do the extremities. Uh, but there's a guy that obliterated the record uh, last year, maybe. But Ned Brockman. Um, pardon? That Ned Brockman, was that? No, no, no. He uh, completely annihilated his attempt. Oh, um, really? Yeah, yeah. This this guy, man, again, this guy... Um, I think he goes by the bull. His name's escaping me. I'm I'm really sorry. Uh, I I feel bad for not thinking of his name, but um, he averaged just over 100k a day, and that dude, like again, like 
no nonsense, just head down, went about his business. Uh, and, you know, like to put it in perspective for people, you know, you talk about um, the Welsh weather and, uh, and terrain um, as a complete contrast uh the the australian for lack of a better term outback uh it you know and western australia in particular and that bottom that bottom end of south australia it's it's a really unique vast place like there is hundreds of kilometers between towns and when i say towns i mean like little places with you know 20 houses and a convenience store or a pub you know like a big thing that I didn't expect and uh, and took me by surprise, which I which won't happen next time, was the feeling of uh, of vulnerability and and real loneliness. Like you, like if somebody wanted to do something to you out there, like no one's finding you and no one's coming. Like it is, like we drove across the country for five days, ran for five days, and drove back for five days and saw two police cars like there is no one around so yeah i don't know how i got on that point but uh but yeah (laughs) so um, i I think i was just going there to say that um yes it's still in my heart to have another go um it's a lot of pressure on everyone but i would really like to have a talk to particularly sean um and maybe the bull and and just get you know some tips and ideas off them i know sean is operating on a a plan that the i think the bull gave him which is like a um like a structured time plan so he has like a thing where he wakes up he has it this might not be exactly right but it's something like he wakes up he has an hour to get ready eat you know do whatever he needs to do get ready then he's on the road for let's say 14 hours and that leaves him no how long is i can't i'm not it's too late to do the math. It's like an hour get ready, <laughs> run for however long, and he has two hours to eat, recover, shower, rest. Then he has eight hours sleep. So it's literally oh. like 24 hours structured in a one hour or whatever hour block of running, two hour recovery, eight hours sleep. So I guess that's 11. Oh. So it's 13 hours of running, um, which is like, that sounds like a pretty cool structure. So I, I don't know. I'm... Mm-hmm. I'm rabbiting, but uh, it's uh, no, 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 no. This is this is interesting. Would you do it if you tried it again? Would you be willing to have people come with you and do it with you, or would you do the more the merrier? Or is it something you'd rather do alone? Or uh, we had a pretty small team before we went over. It was just my dad and a couple of mates. It was actually my dad and one mate, and then um, we had uh a couple of other people join, but. Dude, it's so far in the middle of nowhere. It's just like, you know, but I think if I went again, I'd do even just maybe just one mate or, you know, and and just do it super dirt bag and, you know, no no hurrah or fluff, just just grind away each day and, and get it done. Nice, man. I hope you do. I really hope you do. I um, I was hinting at the fact that maybe one day when you do it, I can make run some of it with you <laughs> or Nathan as well. <laughs> Come on over. Come on over. It'd kill me. It'd absolutely kill me. You'd be laughing at me. <laughs> um, You'd be surprised. you go all right, mate. I'm not sure. It'd be like you coming over here and us taking you into the uh, the Black Mountains in the, in the midst of winter. You'd be... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Mud back to his knees. Oh yeah, I'm, used to, people... I'm used to running in a pair of shorts and uh and shoes, and that's it. And uh, on a yeah. hat, like yeah. all those clothes, nah, it's too much. <laughs> You'd be hypothermic, mate. You would be hypothermic. <laughs> it's impossible. I'll, when you've got, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick, I'll tell you a quick funny story. We um, when I went to <laughs> to Italy for uh for Lavaredo, we skipped into Austria, and um, and I had the uh, opportunity to meet up with uh, a guy named Chris who owns a company called Willpower Running, and uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's a company from Germany who who sponsored me. And Chris has been really kind over the years, and and again one of those internet uh, friendships. And and I had the opportunity to meet with him and another guy named Leo who lives in Innsbruck, and um, we got to go for a run together and hang out. 
And uh, I don't know how the conversation come up, but I think we were talking about like what I was going to wear in Lavaredo. I'm like, I'm telling like, oh, I bought a pair of like, um, we call them man prees. They're like um, capris, but for men, you know, like three quarter tights. And uh, and I'm like, oh, I bought a pair. And they were just like, Chris just started like laying it on thick. He's like, tights, like guys don't wear tights here. We wear pants. It's like this whole like long pants thing. I'm like, bro, you wore them in Australia. You get kicked off the trail and laugh that. I'm like, no one's running in long pants in Australia. I'm like, that's like tracksuit pants. So it's just this funny little like back and forth with cultures. And uh, yeah, so I might not be allowed on the Welsh trails in my man freeze. I might have to find some pants. <laughs> I think it's over here, mate, is part of the mandatory checklist. You you because the weather can just change so quickly. Like like it's it's insane. And again, if you get wet and cold and you're stuck in the middle of the Black Mountains or the middle of the Brecon Beacons, it, well, put it this way, you can to walk up Penavanis, which is one of the Welsh peaks, I think it's well, it's only four less than five miles walking up it. And it's been known in the past that you'd be stood at the bottom in like a vest, shorts and trainers, you can get to the top and it could be snowing. And it's not even the highest peak. And that's legit. They have, they've had a lot of people who've been called out mountain rescue and things like that because that's how quick it can change. So uh, I think if you were topless in your shorts and trainers, mate, you'd, you'd get yourself into a bit of a problem a bit. <laughs> yeah, I've been in some precarious situations in some uh, limited gear, but uh, that's a whole nother world, that's for sure. I can imagine. Actually, precarious situations of just touching on like subject of that and pain and discomfort and stuff out of curiosity so when you're running these these distances these long distances and stuff um how do you deal with pain and discomfort during big races do you like um i've read that people do it different ways like people you know they'll break it down into mo moments or they'll break it down into checkpoints or they'll put music in is there any kind of tips you've got for anybody who finds himself in that situation yeah i think i think a lot of time uh people overthink things and they put they put too much mental thought into the situation that they're in right then uh if i'm just in quote unquote physical pain um you know let's face it it's probably just discomfort um, because you know you're on a long climb or a hard descent or whatever that like that does not phase me at all it's just you I just know that that's going to pass uh, and I always break a race down aid station aid station so you know you can't think about running 100 miles or 100k it's 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 too far for your brain to comprehend so you just think I've just got to run you know 15k to the next aid station uh, and a little a little trick that I do, which I probably don't again suggest, is I typically don't spend any time, or maybe I glance at a course map or profile. Um, I don't really want to know. Like I, when I get on the trails, I um because I don't get the opportunity to run trails a lot. When I get on the trails, I it's a really amazing experience, and it's and it's something I treasure and really enjoy. So I don't really need to know that in 5K, there's a massive climb coming. I'm just like, it's going to be there regardless. So I get there and then get on with it when I get there, you know. Uh, when you come to actual like actual physical pain, uh, you know, like the stomach stuff I've experienced in in the last couple of years, man, it's, it's really difficult. Like, um, you know, like at Lavaredo, I got to the checkpoint at like 99K and I was like, I was sick. Like I wasn't leaving that aid station. And I like, my wife's like, they're all excited to see me. My wife and daughters were crewing for me and they're all excited. They've been waiting there for probably 15 hours. No, not that long, but a long time. <laughs> um, and I'm like just a misery guts. And they're like, oh, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm going to lay in the fetal position on the ground and I'm not going to move. And <laughs> that's what I did. And uh, my wife's like, like jamming, like these noodles in my mouth and like, <laughs> come on, you've got to eat. And, and like, she saw that nothing was happening. She's like, all right, we didn't come all this way for you to be laying here. You've got 10 minutes and you get your ass up and you get out of here. I'm like, 
she knows how to get moving, you know. So, and yeah, so yeah, man, like she she knows, and she did the same thing at our BTU when my stomach went. I was at the last aid station. I was like, I didn't think I was going to leave there either. I was like proper crook, and she was pacing me for the last twenty odd k, and she's like, "Stop your whinging, get some food in here, let's go," and uh, and we got moving, but. Man, it, it, it's difficult you know like it's um when you have that level of of pain and discomfort um the only thing that i can say is is keep moving forward like i i've always had this thing with with perpetual forward motion like you get to an aid station don't stand the aid station for like <laughs> with all due respect mate i was watching your video of your race and i'm like bro we're not getting freaking pedicures get your socks on don't even take your socks off. Get your socks on and start walking. Are you killing me? I'm like, he spent 15 hours in the aid stations. You could have won. <laughs> no, but seriously, I'm like, we should like, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I, I I needed to get food in me, man. I needed pot noodles. I needed. I got a real funny story, right? So you being a, eat while you're walking. Oh, I struggle though. Like it's it's hard. I, I I do that, but I struggle to eat when I'm moving. And I think I got a lot better as it went on. But the first few, I spent far too much time there. But I got a funny story that you're going to appreciate, Matt. So I said it in one of the recent podcasts. So being obviously, you know, an owner of a coffee, two specialty coffee shops. So we rock up to checkpoint two, <laughs> and the guy who I ended up running, a friend of mine, Paul, who I ended up running eighty miles with. So we're sat there. I was having a quick change of clothes. I'd run out. I hadn't um, reapplied sun cream, so I'd run out of it. So I just, I felt really overheated. So I was trying to get water in me and stuff. But I also had a coffee. And, you know, they bring out, you know, instant coffee just to give you a quick shot. And you're doing that and you're getting changed. My friend Paul is sat there with a V60 coffee dripper and paper filters with enough grand coffee for the <laughs> for every checkpoint, right? And I'm like, I'm laughing. And he's what? just like, honestly. And I said, I was like, what have you got? And he's like, I got to have my grand coffee for every checkpoint. And I was like, you are shitting me. Honest to God, I, I've got a video of it I will send to you. And it's the funniest thing. But I will say this. I never once saw him get that out of his, his drop bag for the remainder of the race. <laughs> I Did think he have a BCC in every aid station or in his pack? No, in his drop, so there was three three drop bags, um, sorry, three checkpoints where you had access to your drop bag, two, five, and six, I think it was. And then in his drop bag was this real nice V60 dripper. Because I looked over, I'm drinking my coffee and thinking I'm spending too long here. And I'm looking over him and I'm like, what the hell is that? He's like, it's a dripper. I'm like, dude, come on, man, seriously, this is Mate, I, I have heard some things happen in races. <laughs> I have never heard of anyone going to that level for coffee. No, like I've had no, this coffee brought to me, but not like that's. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm like, like shocked in a happy way or like disgusted. I that's that is insane. I'm gonna tell him that. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell him that. But in my defense, that's as well, a great story. That, at the um at the checkpoints of my defense as well. The first, the second and the third checkpoints, they realized my bloody tracker wasn't working. So yeah. they had to drive someone in from God knows where because it took them a while to get to me. Uh turned out it couldn't be fixed. So I had to go to the next checkpoint and they had to do the same thing there and they could fix it. But yeah, I know I spent I did spend a long time in the checkpoints on this one, but you know, I uh, that's that's something that you learn as you go along though, like and it depends on your goals, right? Like going back to my dad, like, right, man, he has like a picnic and he talks to everyone and he's hugging just... people and kissing babies. And I'm like, I'm not wasting time. I'm just like, get in and get out. Like, unless I'm, as I said, unless, like at BTU at the last race at the 100 mile I just did, I, um, I hadn't had my girls, uh, crew me for some time for a race. And, um, I deliberately spent a bit more time in aid stations because they were like, it was amazing. Like, it's a lot for them, you know. Like, they, it nearly well, one's a teenager and one is nearly a teenager, so it's like they don't care about dad running around the bush. Like, you know, it's but they were like super into it, like wanting to 
take out rubbish and get me food and refill my pack. And like, so I'm like, you know what? It was a bit overwhelming at times, but I was like, you know what? Just shut your mouth and just spend a bit of time and let them help. And it was like, it was really nice. So it was, um, it depends on your goals. Usually I'm like in and out, give them my bottles and I'm like out of there, but, um, Yeah. yeah, it's uh, yeah. a lot of time wasted in aid stations. Yeah, exactly. I think going back very quickly to the pain thing you said about, and again, that comes into stopping at checkpoints. I think with the pain and discomfort thing, I think it's not like the physical pain, like you said, of the, your legs aching and things like that. Because I always remember listening to uh, the a podcast with Courtney Dewalter when she DNF'd on her first 100 miler because. She said her legs are just in too much pain, but afterwards she realized that that's just if you you know if you're 60 miles in the race, that's just natural. Of course, you're going to be in pain. You just got to learn to push past it. But I think it's acknowledging that there's a very big difference between discomfort, your physical discomfort, and pain, or uh, and being injured and unsafe. So I think there's there's like you said, if you're vomiting and is coming out the other side as well. And everything you put in, you've come back up and you're, you know, you can't even keep water down and you've still got another 60 miles of a, a race on a hot day. I think it's also acknowledging that actually, is this safe? You know, it, it's not point in putting yourself six foot under for a race. You've still got a family to go home to us. And I think there's just a, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying about the physical pain. Yeah. And that's, that's individual to each person, you know, like I've, I've certainly, I for a long time prided myself on never having a, a DNF. Uh, and then I did some hard races and now I am of the opinion that if you, if you don't have a DNF, you're not trying hard enough races. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I say that to say that, you know, I've, I've certainly not finished races because of, um, because of injury, because of, you know, various reasons and, and for each individual person, that level of, what you're willing to put yourself through and at what point you're willing to persevere uh, is mm -hmm. different. Um, and I think, you know, like sometimes it's easy to look at people that, that quote unquote quit and you're like, mate, if you just would have sat there for 20 minutes and, you know, and, and persevered and, and walked, then maybe you might've come good, but you know, but, who am I to pass that judgment on anyone, you know, like we're all in our own little journey and, and they've towed the start line and, um, and they're there having a go. And and that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's dealing with variables that like my dear first DNF last year, which I'm going back to do the same race now, the 3rd of August was because I had a really bad chest. So I'd not been well leading up to it. I think my boy had brought lovingly brought something home from nursery as, as they like to do. And um, I kind of pushed through it and I got to about marathon distance and I decided to just throw my hands up and kind of have a strop and quit and throw my bag and what have you, because I just, a, a variable that you can't control is, you know, I couldn't really breathe and the weather was diabolical and I, <laughs> I can deal with aching in my knees and legs, but if I can't breathe properly and I've still got a marathon left, um, and then I saw Nathan just stroll through the checkpoint and say hello to me, and I was like, "Yeah, bastard!" <laughs> He's but, on the way yeah, to run the whole road. Exactly, but yeah, that's coming back. Retribution, retribution, indeed, as you said. Okay. Can't wait. Um, I, I guess. I mean, I'm sorry we've taken up a lot of your time, but I just wanted to. I mean. Um, I guess just just thank you for coming on here, and I'm, I do want to I do want to ask, with your amazing collection of tattoos, I do have to ask. Come on, you've got to have one that you you a funny tattoo or or one of what is one of your first tattoos that you look back and you think, oh shit, look at that bad boy, or like have you got a favorite tattoo or something? You got to you got to have something. Ah, <sighs> I only have one tattoo now. Oh, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah. I like that. It's a good way of putting it. Yeah. yeah, I like that. So, That's a good way of putting it. I'm actually like, again, this ebbed and flowed too. Like for a long time there, you know, it sounds kind of weird, but somebody who was reasonably heavily tattooed actually didn't like really talking about it and, and people making a big deal about it. I was like, just, it's just my thing. Like 
leave me be. Whereas now, like my bodysuit's finished, I'm like, I'm, I feel kind of honored. To, like I've had a couple of older people recently in, in summer, um, like actually stop me and ask me about it and comment how amazing it is and like it's it's super sweet. So I uh, actually like like I'm actually really proud of the fact that my bodysuit's done. It's like been the longest ultra marathon you'll ever do. Like I got my first. tattoo when i was 17 and i finished it i finished my suit like the end of last year so it's like 25 years um and all but probably four years in there i was getting tattooed like pretty regularly uh but as far as favorite ones go um man i forget even sometimes what i got um and i, I was kind of fortunate i didn't get any like I've got a couple of like ordinary ones, but not like anything real bad that I'm like cringe over. Um, and a lot of the first ones that I got, I uh, got covered up, not for any reason, just that they were in the way of like my back piece or, you know, like other tattoos. Um, but I've, yeah, I've had the fortune to be tattooed by some really amazing uh, tattooists. And I think, I think the themes of most of mine are probably more uh, important to me than the tattoos themselves. Like, uh, you know, like I've got a lot of, um, a number of Christian tattoos. I've got like some vegan ones. I've got like some straight edge ones. Uh, I guess that's another like reasonably interesting thing about me. I've never, I've been straight edge my whole life. So I've never tried alcohol, drugs or cigarettes Um like my whole life the only alcohol i've ever had was wine at communion when i was a kid uh and yeah so you know so i guess the themes of them um i have a a real uh deep interest in um in japanese culture and tattoos so you know one side of my body is sort of like i've got some really epic japanese stuff um and then the old school stuff is like the remainder of it so that's another big like fascination of mine but i guess if i had to put like i think the two pigeon pair favorite are my armpits i like yeah i was gonna bring them they up turned but out I sort of them Oof, no yeah they turned out really good like i got like like a gorilla with a bump on his head and then like this this dude dan did this like epic uh, chrysanthemum in my arm like japanese flower and it just it's really good So like, I think my armpits are like, and because of where they are, it's like, they're pretty epic tattoos. Yeah. That hurt like hell, oh, man. Yeah, it all hurts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Mate, uh, sorry, I wanted to, I can't believe I haven't touched on this. You mentioned Japanese tattoos and stuff then. You need to talk about what you've got coming up. Obviously, you, you did the Brisbane Ultra Trail. Congratulations again for that, mate. And, and now you've got okay. something coming up in Japan. What, what is it you're doing in Japan? Yeah, I got to get back to training and we've all been hit with the old sickness like you were talking about before this week. So my training's been pushed a week. Like I just had a a short week by my standards this week. So hopefully tomorrow we'll get back into it. But um, yeah, uh, I guess it's nine weeks Um, where uh, well, we're heading to Japan before nine weeks. But in nine weeks time, I'm, I'm going to be doing the, uh, now I think it said Shinzuku 100K, uh, sorry, 100 miler. Uh, I'm not a fan of doing races for other races, but um, when we have to travel so far for races and we don't have a lot of qualifying races for other races, I've sort of picked events based around requalifying for Western States Lottery. Um, so it's a States qualifier. Uh, you were talking about food before. I'm actually... reasonably nervous about what i'm going to eat at aid stations in japan um <laughs> that might be interesting there might be a lot of rice and plain noodles i don't know uh but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it but um i'll be taking a, a stack of nutrition with me so yeah so we'll have uh, i think we got like nearly three weeks in japan and wow. um you know again making a, a holiday out of it and throw a little uh, 100 miler in the Japanese Alps uh, in the mix as well. That's amazing, man. Yes. That'd be incredible.
Oh. Yeah, it's gonna be good. And then uh, and then to round the year out, I've got a an FKT or for, it it will I think be a first time run uh plan for uh the end of the year. So that's gonna be a seven day um FKT attempt. So uh yeah so a few things coming and all my little personal goals and in, in thrown in the mix and lots of training and good times a couple of hardcore shows in there too so i'm pretty excited about that that's gonna be good amazing man amazing what um have you got any bucket lists then, I, I, we ask this to everyone what is your absolute bucket list race if you could um well it doesn't have to be one but is there a particular stand date one that you were just love to do so i guess if you put it into um i've got a heap of self like solo type like crew adventures that i want to do um if you take them out of the mix um races um like i actually literally blogged about it today like western states is my like my lifetime dream race uh i've you know i've followed it religiously from when i got into ultra marathon running um every year seen it grow and change and uh, i just got to get through that damn lottery um and i was actually like my plan was like part of my plan was to finish my run across australia and apply for a uh, special entry um but never happened so uh so i gotta keep going for the lottery but uh western states um hard rocks up there but we like we only have i think we only have one qualifier in australia and one in new zealand um and like they i just have never got to do those races for whatever reason so qualifying for hard rocket and the lottery there it's near impossible as well um recent recent years in the last like three years i've taken a real interest in uh in the speed project um mm. and i'd really, I'd really love to have a crack at that solo um mm. that would be super cool and then i mean there's a there's a long list but western states is 100 percent the top of the bundle i would die happy a happy man uh the day i finish western states amazing man that's awesome that's still cool. Nice one, Matt. I, I just wanted to say again, I know it's been uh, back and forth a few attempts to try and get you on here. It was difficult with the time zones and everything, but thank you for taking time at your your evening uh, to do this with us and stuff. And um, I'm just really, really like psyched that we finally managed to get it done and uh, have a proper chat as opposed to on Instagram. And um, I hope that it's not the last time you come on here. Maybe we can get you on here again. In the future, definitely, if especially if you, or I should say when you do that run across Australia, because you are going to do it, and um, we'll get you back on there. And uh, maybe, hopefully, we can get you over here and uh, exploring the Welsh mountains as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah. Might, uh, I might not end up quite there, but uh, I, um, BTU got me, I think I've got more than enough points, but I'm going to put in for the lottery for uh, for UTMB next year as well. So, oh, nice. Might skip over and, um, I might be looking for crew if I uh, if I get in the lot through the lottery for that. So, um, yeah, but uh, just uh, thanks to you guys for for having me. I mean, I love um, I love doing podcasts, and I it's an honor every time I get to do them. And uh, and if anyone wants to reach out, I'm pretty easy to find on social media, Strava, or my website, and um, and love to keep the chat going and uh, and make connections and just keep keep the vibe high with uh you know with the, whoever i stumble across along the way and um mm -hmm. and sit late with so yeah so thanks to you guys and and keep up the good work cheers man that was well. super cool cheers man thanks, I was really, really Love that. appreciate that man we'll uh we'll catch up soon cheers man for thanks sure. so much for coming thanks, on man. Mate. bye peace take care man you too as always Thank you so much to anyone who has tuned in, listened and subscribed to our previous episodes. I hope you all agree that that was just an awesome episode with Matt. Uh, and we've got some amazing guests coming up next week and the week after as well. So please, if if you get a chance, go and visit their Instagrams, go and look at their stuff, get inspired because they're all really cool people, um, as are you. So thank you so much again to everyone who's listened and watched and subscribed. Um, yeah, can't wait for future episodes. Thanks for tuning in. 
Thanks all Cheers, for bye. listening, guys. Bye. Cheers.